The lady says recording is in progress, so it's two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get uh, going. Hello, I'm John Barton. I'm pastor at Trinity United Methodist and uh, uh, associate pastor across the street at Grace. And uh, this continues our, bio, or our study on the book, Think Like Jesus. And uh, we're in the fifth session today, so there will be three more after today. And uh, the, our sessions uh, include a short video this week. It's only about 12 minutes long and a discussion on what we learned from our personal study last week, as well as uh, what we see in the video this week. And so we'll continue our discussions and we'll start off with a spot of, spare, spot of prayer. So if you would join me for a uh, prayer, our most gracious and heavenly father, we again, thank you for this opportunity to come together, to draw closer to you through the study of your word. This time it's through a book called Think Like Jesus. And I would ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon us. Your spirit would guide us and lead us. And so that at the end of the day and the end of the week and the end of the year, each time when we look back on our lives, we would say that we were just a little bit more like Jesus in thought and in deed and in speech. Lord, be with us now as we continue our study. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we uh, did chapter four, and chapter four was uh, in, well, session three, session four was how does the Bible guide my life? And I call your attention to page 64 in our personal study. There's a quote there from Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. And I don't think anybody probably has not heard that before, but in the section, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and the purpose and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So that's on page 64, about the middle of the page, uh, right above where it says Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. Anybody heard that before that God's word goes out and won't return to him void and it will accomplish the purpose that he was, he was intending with it? Would anybody like to say a time when God's word directly acted in your life to the point where you'd say that it didn't return void, that God's word was uh, indem indemnifying in your life and was of great personal value to you at some point? He said, go preach, and it sure changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> go preach. Well, I, that's, yes, I could turn it a little way. I know some of you are camera shy and try to make sure you don't end up on the camera. The camera. <laughs> but um, hey, go preach. Yes? I what? think during, I, I think during um, COVID, it was a very stressful time, and I think I probably prayed more during that time than I have during other times. And I think that that bringing peace shows that God's word was going out, you know, to say, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. And it, it just helped me get through that. All right, so if we go on, anyone else have anything they'd like to say at this point? When I got ready to retire, I don't know why, but I made up my mind I was going to start church somewhere continuously. And I came here 20 years ago, and I'm still here. Okay. Because I worked in a factory for a lot of years. You could hear some of the things you wanted to. Right. 
And I've enjoyed every minute. I enjoy every person that's in this church. Oh, and you started by coming to our study, Michael's study. Well, yeah, I started coming homes. to church. And then I start June Edgerton, the one that got me involved in about everything. She was my neighbor. Oh, that's good. She brought me in. Well, Jim was hired um, at Indiana State by, um, by the superintendent and uh, Bill Fred. And, uh, and he was Methodist. And they had a contract and they had him sign it. Then he called me to tell me he was going to Harvard City. So I had to look on the map because <laughs> I didn't know where that was. But I, you know, I, I praise him that he sent us to a good place. And Jim sang in the choir. And, uh, and, and we went to the Methodist Church. Jim was Methodist. I was Presbyterian, but that was. Wonderful. It's been ever since. Well, in 2006, my parents and I, uh, we had a reason for starting at the Eaton Church of God. And so we went there and we we're kind of uh, fulfilling what we thought was a little bit of an obligation, I guess you'd say. And it was a little too contemporary. And so they projected words up on a screen. Can you imagine that to sing with? <laughs> Heavens. And so we were looking around in Hartford City and uh, we picked Grace because we thought it was big enough that we wouldn't have to get involved. <laughs> you hiding? Why did the good Lord have a plan for you? <laughs> and, you know, so, some things our plans don't work out, but I, I think that there's probably some Bible verses you could find about listening, but I, I remember uh, we sat down in what became mom and dad's seat, so it's probably not anymore, but it was for, for several we years. We still living in their room. We're praying that yeah. they get back. And Lloyd Hall sat down behind us and welcomed us, and then Sue Llewellyn called us on Monday, and, you know, so we, we, we were welcomed, and then things changed no matter what our plans were so you went the right direction yes you did <laughs> all right so if we go to page 65 there's four things in there I think there are four he says first and this is toward the bottom of the page in the last paragraph on the page first we read that the bible is, is inspired or breathed out by God himself Paul writes, and we talked about this last week, that it is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Has anybody ever need teaching from the Bible? How about rebuking? You ever been off track and someone's uh, suggested something to you that you were off track and maybe provided you with a little bit of scripture to help you get back on track. Maybe you found it yourself, supposedly. Maybe you found it through the instruction of the Holy Spirit that, you know, you, you were kind of lost and somehow you opened a page in the Bible, not necessarily, necessarily knowing what you were looking for. And there was something that spoke to you there on the page. Rebuking. I like that word rebuking. Next word he, that he uses there is correcting. And uh, I guess rebuking, I don't see a lot of difference between rebuking and correcting. Maybe rebuking is a little bit more stronger uh, correction. I don't know. But uh, sometimes I wonder if we are uh, willing to accept rebuking or correcting anymore. I don't think our culture really is. I'm, I'm pretty sure our, our culture is full speed ahead in whatever direction they want to go. And if, if you happen to offer an opinion that's different, then they'll provide rebuking and correcting. And then training in righteousness. And that last word, righteousness, is a good one to remember because that's what God's trying to do. 
I mean, he sent Christ so that we would have Christ's imputed righteousness. So our sin would be paid for after we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And so we would have a path of reconciliation. But uh, and training in righteousness implies that there's something longer term going on than just an immediate correction that God's continuing a work in us. So that was first. And then if we turn the, to the next page, which after 65, yes, it is, it's 66. Second, we read that God revealed or breathed his message into chosen people to be written down. And so he goes on to talk about over 1400 years, how many different art authors they were. He talked about that last week in the movie and 40 authors and 66 books. And that uh, talks about the accuracy of it, the translation where they can compare the current translations to the most ancient translations and how accurate it really is to the most ancient copies of the text that we have. And then third, we read the Bible as infallible. And I, I wonder if through the years, our understanding of what infallible means has changed, like so many words have changed. But he says, third, we read that the Bible is infallible or unfailing in accomplishing his purposes. Is that what we think of when, when we hear the word infallible now? Because what he's saying there, if that's what infallible means, that's pretty much the same thing Isaiah said at the end. That God's purpose would be, let's see, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I think we, we think of infallible as not being something wrong or that there's can't be something wrong with it but i don't know yeah you make me think too much oh sorry infallible would be not fallible well fallible sounds a lot like falling down so now i've been doing word study in my head i need to look that up because there's a it sounds pretty close to I gave you the word so you don't fall down morally. Yeah. It's bad enough to fall down physically. <laughs> and in some ways, it's even worse to fall down morally. So I never thought about it that way. I'll bet there's a connection mm. infallibly. We don't use that word in everyday language yeah. much. I think of it hmm. as truth. God is truth. So well, does that make it infallible? Truth? Well, the, yeah, I think it's infallible as God gave it to us. It's probably not infallible as we choose to apply it. You know, LeBron talking there about falling down, falling down morally or falling into unrighteousness. That makes it sound like it's something it's, that's an act. It's an accident, and a lot of times our unrighteousness isn't an accident. It's a choice, but but uh, uh, I think you're right. And last week we talked to, about the truth that we find in Scripture, and I think that goes back to uh, how we started today, talking about teaching and rebuking and correcting that, and the other one that I'm missing, but. Uh, that the Bible is there and it will provide a correction on our path so that we turn to learning was the other one. The, Instruction and righteousness. Right. Yeah. right thinking. Right. So that we move toward the place God wants us to be, which is not where he found us. He gives us the strength to become fallible. More and more, yeah. We're holy. Holy. Mm -hmm. there, there's somebody in the 
Wesleyan tradition that was really into personal holiness. I'm speaking of John Wesley. All right, so anybody have anything else they'd like to talk about there? I see all scripture is God read and is useful for teaching. Does that give us an option? Well, it is useful for teaching. Right. I mean, how well we learn the lesson has something to do with the quality of our teacher, but it also has it has as much or more to do with our interest in our dedication to learning what's being presented to us. And so anybody ever learn something wrong? You know, uh, high school geometry and uh, you were copying down one of those proofs and you left one little character off and you learned it, you learned it wrong. And then it, it, every time you'd use it, the teacher says, no, that's wrong. And so we, while God's word is infallible, our application and our understanding of it don't necessarily, well, certainly won't be as infallible as his word is. That's, it. That's just how we are. And we talked last week about it on page 67 about on the key application toward the bottom. First, the Bible should be the lens through which we view the world and everything we encounter. You could almost say that it's the standard. It's a standard of righteousness. Perhaps more so the teachings of Jesus and what we find in the prophets than going back to Leviticus and viewing uh, the world through the lens of the kosher dietary laws, but the moral aspects of both the Old and New Testament certainly are a lens through which we should view the world. And then second, he says, if we believe the Bible is God's inspired word, we should be motivated to study it to understand God's will. I think there's a lot of Bible study going on in our world today. Not nearly enough. <laughs> so, and I, I think we would, I think we would point to that and say that the disinterest of people in God's world today, or God's word today, has a lot to do with the state of the world today. But you know, it's. It's more about what we can get away with than trying to live to any sort of righteous or moral standard. I think a lot of people say, well, I know God and I understand God and he understands me and we can just do what we want to. Right. Well, we don't need to read the Bible. We don't need any assistance. We already know. They're interpreting yeah, the way they want to. And that's that's nothing it new. Is right. It is sad, it is but it's nothing new. People throughout history have, and Paul warns about that in the book of Romans. He's a, he asks a rhetorical question. What then shall we do? Shall we continue sinning so that God's righteousness will abound? And, you know, it, it, that later there's some heretics that espouse something like that, that you can do anything once you're saved because God's grace is enough to cover your sin. And Paul goes on to point out that if God's word and Christ is in you, you should no longer have the same desire you had to sin. And so perhaps you should look and see whether God is truly, Christ is truly in you. That is so important. I don't know where I first learned that, but it didn't take me long to figure out. I think it's true. There are some people who believe that the end justifies the means. Now, that's a funny way to put it, you know, because I grew up with Hitler and the Third Reich, the, the German um, 
goal to purify its race and establish a, a kingdom. I'm not quite sure if it was meant to benefit anyone else, but blue-eyed, blondes, white skin. At any rate, so you see that in Putin, you know. Well, the Ukraine, we used to own Ukraine. And the end is that we get it back. And yeah. that justifies doing anything it takes. Uh, in the United States, you know, we love freedom and <clears throat> the freedom to go out and make a lot of money called capitalism. And so the factories sometimes, if the end gets the product out, I make a lot of money. I don't care how we get there. I can work you like a dog for 12 hours and give you a 15 minute break. Because the end profit motive right. justifies anything I do to make it work. And, and then, you know, I go to meddling, you know, the church sometimes do things. I mean, the end is glorious. But the way you get there, you know, and of course, it's easy to come down on the prosperity gospel. Well, if you will believe in me and believe the Bible and anything you pray for is yours, all you have to do is ask and you'll give it back 10 times over and tamp down. Oh, well, the end is that everybody be prosperous. Well, I need a few million dollars to build this beautiful church. And that happened in the Middle Ages, you know, every mm. time the, the coin tinkled in the offering pot, I'll promise you, your relative will get out of purgatory. purgatory. You know, the end was beautiful to build the basilica, the greatest church in the world or whatever. But the means to get there was robbing from the poor. And we got a lot of poor people today that are really in trouble because, well, we don't want to go there. But, you know, the worldview. And I, and if, if everybody had the same worldview, like the golden rule, yeah. wouldn't it be great? Right. If they, if we were all looking out for our brothers and sisters and thinking about what was best for them instead of just trying to put money in our pocket. Yeah. And we see it happen a lot of times, you know. There's a tragedy. Boy, a GoFundMe page and money just rolls in. Amazing. You can imagine. We went to annual conference. I thought, what? $25,000? Then the bishop wanted $100,000. What you can't a hundred thousand dollars in three days, a little over a thousand people. You know, they wrote back home to the church and said, You know, you could help us out. And one church gave ten thousand okay. dollars. Well, that was a, a good step along the way to a hundred thousand for what I think 99 and 44 hundred people would say was a good right. thing to do. What was it? It was to support Exodus. Well, who's Exodus? Exodus, and they're not a fly by night. They've been around for a long time. They help resettle people that walk out of their homeland with a suitcase. That's all they got. Afghanistan's where we first heard about it here, where I first heard about it. And now it's Ukraine. I mean, these people, and they're just the tip of the iceberg. You have refugees. All over the world, yeah. running away from something horrible. But you know, you do what you can. And I'm sure they're very happy to get a shot in the arm, a hundred thousand dollar check. Yeah, they'll go there, they'll be on church. Maybe they want another hundred thousand. Well, you know, the poor will always have with us and we'll never be able to win them all. But it's like the starfish thing, you know. Yeah. The one we say was great. Yeah. What? What? Did you say? The starfish story. I'll read the story. You have time. You don't have time. Little boy on the beach is walking along. Oh. There's been Jump. a storm or something, and all the starfish, starfish. are 
I don't no want to save the jellyfish. No. <laughs> save the starfish. Yeah. Well, talk about that. Jellyfish are mean. Now, <laughs> yes, that's not are. nice. They're God's creation, yes. too. Well, they have a purpose. They have a understand. purpose. No, I mean, and purpose. somebody enlightened me that uh, the people you'd think they'd want to grow in population, they are pro abortion. They didn't want you by telling them they can't have more. And uh, and this happened to be a black person. And I told the prayer group uh, yesterday, we do one on the phone. And I said, well, we saved one. She says, what's that? I said, well, my grandson and his wife just adopted a baby. It went down Mississippi, got a baby, black baby. We saved one. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get on our case for that. We raised them right. Well, I think told my brother who went down Mississippi. Is it white, baby? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're being recorded. Your brother's watching. <laughs> Forgot. <laughs> All right. So anybody else got anything they'd like to say for last week's personal study or anything you'd like to add? Because if not, we'll go on to this week. And that starts on page 73, session five. Who am I in Christ? When you read, who am I in Christ? Would anyone like to say what that, what thoughts that conjures up in your mind? What thoughts it brings up? It's a miracle. It's a mystery. Our worth is no longer defined by what we do, but by who we know. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's the goal of our relationship with Christ is to no longer be defined by what we do, but instead to be defined by who we know. And knowing and, you know, sometimes we get into a little bit of trouble because we say things like if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we get in a little bit of trouble because it makes it sound like all you have to say to be a follower of Christ is that, but it's that plus a continued dedication of your life more fully to Christ. It's not just a one and done sort of thing. Christ wants to continue to be in you and work through you and continue the process like we learned about learning and rebuking and teaching and that Christ wants to establish a relationship, an ongoing relationship. It's not to be just... an extension of Christ. Okay, an extension of Christ like that. Rest of our lives. For the rest of our lives, yes. Okay. Yeah. You said something that made me think of scripture in Romans 10, 9 and 10. It talks about if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It sort of um, finishes it. Mm. We believe in a heart, and then you tell somebody else that confirms it. And we could say that that's one of the reasons why we go through baptism, is to show other people the choice that we've made, especially in a believer's baptism where, you know, you're older when you make it, that you're standing before the congregation and saying that I have put Jesus Christ in my life. So it's confirming the heart decision that we have already made. But some people believe they're baptized, then they do what they want to again. Oh, that's true. We, no problem. we kind of talked about that that's before. True. We correct them. We <laughs> <laughs> gotta try. Well, we can't try. Where do you read that in the Bible? <laughs> What's that song? Baptizing the blood, soul cleansing power of the blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You used to talk about that. Yeah. I heard. I heard it somewhere, I don't know if it was this week in a conference or what, that somebody wanted to be baptized, but he didn't want anybody to know it. Mm -hmm. He's afraid the wrong people would get, get word of it and do something to him. And that can happen in some countries if you convert from 
one group to another. Well, I was baptized when I was about 13, but I don't want to do it again. I don't want everybody to see me. I want to hide in the background. <laughs> I'll stay back. <laughs> Words out. <laughs> so conference was this week. Hmm? Conference was this week. Last yeah, Thursday, last Friday, Friday, and Saturday. And it was at Indiana Westland. It was close that we right. drove back and forth. Oh, wonderful. I haven't been to it so long because it's been in Indianapolis. Uh -huh. I didn't want to go down there every day. Of course, if I had to go there, I'd stay there. But I talked to several people asking that question, and there were a lot of people from Evansville and down in there that had little interest in coming that much further north from Indianapolis. So we do have a college, a university in Indianapolis. Right. Mm -hmm. University right. of Indianapolis. Right. Yeah. Well, that's where we do courses study. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I. Golden Rule. I, I drive there to right. help my brother in Evansville. Absolutely. And I think that if there hadn't been a, well, I really think it was the bottom line that made the choice this time. Cost. Yeah, okay. because they had it's, they it's, had bids from Crawfordsville and IWU and or, uh, um, what's it? Cra not Crawfordsville. Uh, Greencastle. Oh, Greencastle. Uh, what's DePaul? DePaul. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something that was from right. We've had school meetings there. It's nice place. So, so who am I in Christ is what chapter five talks about, session five. And there's a phrase in the middle of that page on page 73. He views us as his own beloved children, significant beings, new creations, and heirs to his own kingdom. It's kind of hard to sometimes wrap your head around when you first become a Christian, because I think for me, was I really worthy? Do I really live my life in a way that's worthy to the sacrifice that was made by God on my behalf? And, you know, Paul talks about while we were still sinners, God provided the remedy for our sin. And thank God for that. Reverend Lloyd used to always say how grateful he was that he lives on this side of the cross where the forgiveness was available for the taking through faith by grace. So. Well, I hate to be a Jew. He's kind of tough on those scholars. <laughs> what did you say? I said, I hate to be a Jew. He's kind of tough on those scholars in the Old Testament. Well, I, I think that's a good lesson for us, though. Yes, it is. But because it, in some of Paul's letters, and Jesus talked about we would be held responsible for what we know. And so we know who Jesus Christ is, and we know why he came. And so we'll be held responsible for what we knew and what we did with what we knew. And specifically how well we shared what we knew with other people. And so the Jews were kind of in that same situation. They knew who God was. And they knew that there was a promised Messiah. And they could look into Jesus' life and decide whether he was of God or the choice that many of them made that he was a uh, Beazelbob, some of them accused him of. And so, you know, the, the more you know about God, the more re responsibility you have to do something with that knowledge. And I guess we could go back to we're all responsible for teaching and rebuking and correcting and learning and gaining in righteousness as we help others along the path that, you know, we've already walked at least a portion of. So anyway, well, I think we're up to watching the movie. So we'll watch our little video and we'll see where we are after that. Right. Questions I gotta fill in the blanks. Let's see.
Did they discuss anything about the separation? Church? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. It was mentioned. A lot. Oh, you yeah. voted. You voted? I don't think he's going to postpone it for a couple of years. Hmm? Well, we didn't vote for separation or not separation. Voted on some things that some people wanted us to adopt. We approved the disaffiliation. Right, we approved the disaffiliation. Churches. Right, so I I suppose that is voting on well, 29, 29 instances of separation. Right. Yeah, we right. pulled that. Yeah, Pleasant Grove was the closest one. That was a shocker. Oh, okay. Fairview was so, one of them, wasn't it? Do you remember? That'd be uh, out of Albany. Yeah, yeah, east of Albany oh, on yeah, 28. That was one. Right. Our cousin, it's a two-point charge. Fairview went out. No, I think Fairview stayed and Rehoboth went out. Yeah, I think you're right. Rehoboth. Okay. Rehoboth is on the edge of Parker. Fairviews outside of Albany on Friday. Yeah. 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 And, and that's then, a of young course, church, a lot of young people. Union Chapel Ministries. That surprised me. I won't. I'm not surprised. Who? You're not. Union, Union Chapel. Chapel. Oh, yeah. It was on a three point chart of number and it's been growing. So very, I, very conservative. I talked to a lady today and. <laughs> I told her about our issues, and then she says, uh, I said, well, what does your church do? And she says, we just let them come in. They can, be, they can come to church. Yeah. Anyone can come to church. Yeah. So maybe we talk too much and we scare people away. We had a mass exodus. <laughs> well, we had eight or nine. I think it was nine last year, 29 this year. And then in November, there's churches in process. We'll approve some more. And we don't know. I've heard a guess or two. But why are they getting out before we come to any conclusions? Because the the plan right now for disaffiliation ends on December 30th of 2023. And so there's still another however long till annual conference or general conference in 2024. And what will be the plan then? So Look before we leave folks. Yeah. What? I said, I just said, look before you leave. Yeah, yeah. So I thought they leaked before we came to a conclusion. So oh, okay. if, if you if you didn't see conclusions at annual conference this year, when we're selecting met bishops based upon that beloved covenant, mm -hmm. did we do that? Oh, that was probably just ministers. We who did not participate in that. Is that what you? No, mean? I'm talking bishops. When in. Fort Wayne this year, they're going to select however many new bishops they need at the jurisdictional conference. And the jurisdictional conference adopted that beloved covenant for, for their resolution on how to live, I guess you might say. Jurisdictional this year? Yes. And that's a, several states involved. Yeah. And the general conference is all over the world. Yep. Makes no difference what the discipline says. Right. It's in writing. Yes. It's still there. Yes. Makes no difference. No. Well, that was part of the debate. This time they tried to make a law and they said, you can't. The discipline says this. So it just yeah. kind of stops everything. But anyway. So the answer is yes. Yes, what? We did discuss. All right. Oh, yeah. We discussed lots of. No. And right. things are very close. And we stop okay. some things. Oh, did you good? Yeah, but next year all the conservative, a lot of conservative churches will be gone. 29 and 8 last year. And pro I'd be wouldn't be surprised if there are 50 or more in November. And then 
there will be another round at annual conference next year. And so the things that are stopped by small margins this year will be passed easily next year. Is that a prophecy? It's it's yes. it is. <laughs> yeah. Because the people who are leaving are the ones who were in, gave enough votes to stop it. Yeah. So anyway. All right. So let's watch our video. And let's think like Jesus. And let's be loving and caring and and oh come on. a.m. on October the 3rd, 1987, Roseanne delivered our second child. It had been a long night of pushing and coaching, and to top it off, I had flu-like symptoms. When David finally made his appearance, I was overjoyed. We already had a girl, now we have a boy. Life was perfect and complete. Then I looked down and noticed our son's left hand. Everything below his elbow was missing. I apparently turned white as a ghost, causing the nurses to usher me out of the room. They stuck my head in a stainless steel sink so I could throw up. I never did throw up, but I did have a bunch of questions and thoughts swimming through my head. What about playing baseball with my son? What about the pain on his first day of kindergarten? What about the mean kids in junior high school tearing down the easy mark to build themselves up? What about his wedding day when the minister, likely me, Ask his bride to repeat her vows to my son while she places the ring on his wedding finger. He doesn't have one. The final question poured into my head involuntarily. Will I love him? I wanted and expected a different outcome. Would I be able to accept my son the same way I accepted my daughter? I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually the nurse came back to get me. When I entered the delivery room, another nurse had my son wrapped in a warm blanket. She then handed David to me and I held him. I loved him. He was my son. It was just that simple. One of the most important indicators of your happiness and quality of life will come to the answer to this key question. Who am I? Here's some really good news. Jesus offers us a new identity when we come to faith in him. Here's how the book of John lays out our key verse. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Keep that verse in front of your mind, friends. Memorize it. Let it sink into your heart. At the moment we place our faith in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, a number of really good things automatically and simultaneously happen to us. One of the best things, adoption papers are signed and sealed. We become a child of God. And what happened to my son at his birth happens to us on even a grander scale at our spiritual birth. We become children, chosen and beloved of the Most High God. Now that we've looked at today's key verse, let's explore our key idea. I am significant because of my position as a child of God. That might be hard for some of you to believe that you are significant. Say it with me. I am significant because of my position as a child of God. For most people, their worth as a person comes from their performance. If you achieve great things in the eyes of those whose opinion you respect and sustain that performance over a lifetime, you just might have a strong personal identity, but you will feel the pressure to sustain it. But when a person captures this truth that they are significant in the eyes of God, it can radically change the outcome of their life. One of my favorite stories of all time is the story about a guy named Zacchaeus from the city of Jericho. Zacchaeus was known as a short man, or as the song puts it, a wee little man. No doubt he dealt with short man syndrome. Taller men get all the pretty girls and get elected to president of the class. He was also the chief tax collector for the city. 
That meant he was likely despised by the people of that town. Because the Jews in Jesus' time lived under the rule of the Romans, they were forced to pay taxes to Rome. The Romans would often hire Jews to collect the taxes for them. This made Jewish tax collectors some of the most hated people in all of Israel. The Israelites saw them as traitors to their own people and despised the fact that most tax collectors became rich by collecting more money than the people owed, keeping the extra for themselves. One day, Jesus was passing through a town called Jericho, where a wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus lived. As he approached the town, a crowd formed around Jesus. Zacchaeus was a short man, so he climbed up into a sycamore fig tree to get a better look. As Jesus passed by the tree, he looked up and called out to Zacchaeus by name. Zacchaeus, Jesus said, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus climbed down out of the tree and welcomed Jesus by bowing down in front of him. Everybody standing around saw this and couldn't believe that Jesus was asking to stay with a tax collector. They muttered to each other, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stood up and said to Jesus, look, Lord, here and now I give back half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Then Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Did you notice how Jesus called Zacchaeus out by name? He wanted to hang with Zacchaeus and actually go to his house. People couldn't believe Jesus would do such a thing. The most popular guy on the planet is reaching out to spend time with that rotten tax collector who cheats us out of our money. Jesus saw Zacchaeus differently, didn't he? And this completely and radically affected Zacchaeus. Take a note of what he does next. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Up to this point, Zacchaeus acted out of how other people saw him and how he saw himself. Now someone is seeing him differently and he wants to act differently. According to the Old Testament law, full restitution or repayment on a stolen item was four times the amount of what was stolen. The new Zacchaeus wants to make things completely right. I love what Jesus says to him next in the presence of the large crowd. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was Jewish, but Jewish society didn't recognize him as such. Jesus said out loud for all to hear, you are a son of Abraham. This was a shift in the identity for Zacchaeus. His worth was no longer in his wealth, so he no longer had to cheat people to get it. He was the son of Abraham, and therefore in Christ, the child of God. His worth was now based on his position as a son, not on his performance or status. Did you know that the day you became a Christian, your identity shifted? You became a child of God. Your worth, your identity is no longer wrapped up in your performance or other people's opinion of you. You are a somebody because you are the child of the ultimate somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a somebody. I'm a somebody. It feels strange to say it out loud, but it's true. If you fully grasp this, believe it in your heart, it will change the way you approach each day in at least four ways. Number one, I am free from condemnation. You no longer have to try to earn your relationship with God. His acceptance of you is not based on how good you are or even on how bad you are. You are his child. We said to all four of our children growing up what God says to us. No matter what you do, 
You will always be our child. Those are powerful words to hear. Number two, my worth comes from my position in Christ, not my performance. Every day when I wake up, I try to recite this truth. Today, I might do great things. Today, I might fail. Today, someone will likely try to rob me of my identity, but it is not up for grabs, not today or tomorrow. I am a child of God. This leads to the next application. Number three, I live to express who I am in Christ, not to prove who I am. One of my favorite movies of all times is the 1981 Academy Award winning film, Chariots of Fire. The movie tells the true story of two runners who both ran in the 1924 Olympics and both won gold. The difference, one, Harold Abrams ran to prove who he was. Eric Little, a Christian, ran to express who he knew he was in Christ. Do you see the difference? In the movie, he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. One more. Number four, I can focus on building others up, not tearing them down. One of the primary reasons a person tears another down is to build themselves up. In Christ, we no longer need to do that. Instead, we are freed to concentrate on building others up like Jesus did with Zacchaeus. What a great and crazy, fun way to live. Our son David is now 26 years old. Turns out he played every sport imaginable, more than I ever did, and with better results. He was an all-conference football player with numerous articles in the paper, including a wonderful segment on his athletic accomplishments aired on Fox. He is married to a beautiful, intelligent Christian journalist. He is an attorney with a major law firm. But most of all, David is a modern-day Eric Little. He knows who he is in Christ and runs each day to express who he is versus trying to prove who he is. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. He's still missing that left hand. A little of this mindset has even worn out on his dad. I don't know about you, but I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Anybody have anything they'd like to say before we start talking about what we saw? I think he prejudged the situation about his son. Oh. He thought of the worst. Yeah. And not knowing. He thought of himself. He didn't think about the boy. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. Yeah. He thought of himself as too. Mm -hmm. He felt as a human being and face with something that he never thought he'd have to think about and was surprised and not in a good way. It almost seems like he might have needed a lesson. <laughs> I think he was proved wrong. Yeah. Instruction. Yeah. 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 Right, preacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure he's not the first pastor preacher that's faced such a situation. And our first response is, why me? And sometimes we it takes a little while before we're ready to move on from why me to, okay, God. I sure. know that. I've got a grandson that's handicapped, too. I had a hard time coming to terms, yeah. but we have, and he's now, he's my inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I heard that. The lady at exercise, um, she had a grandson that was uh, handicapped in some way. She says, he taught me so much. Well, and, you know, sometimes people will say, well, why does God keep me here? Because of a situation they find themselves in. And, you know, some of those people, oh, Susan Bakke, I, I, at, at the end of her life in that last week, you know, it, it was just terrible, but she was such an inspiration 
to all the people she met because her faith never wavered. Yeah. And so why? Well, so, I mean, we, we need lessons. And we needed a lesson of someone being hung up on a tree as the, it described several times in the New Testament. We needed a lesson. And, you know, if, if it could be, have been done any other way, it would have been, but it, it was. So we're all through the Old Testament, yeah, it was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we need lessons. And those lessons like the author was talking about are the lessons that teach us who I am. Because how do we respond in those times of trouble? Well, I, I, I'm never surprised by when people choose to do the wrong thing. I'm, I'm sometimes very surprised when people choose to do the right thing. Well, and, it, it's so much easier in our world, especially where you're almost encouraged to do whatever you can get away with. We joke about cheating on our taxes. And, you know, when we joke about that, it's probably because we cheated on our taxes. Because, you know, you can get away with so much. So they catch you, they'll cost you. Well, I'm just, I took statistics, the odds of getting ordered it and getting caught, especially if you're a nobody. Yeah. Pretty slim. Yeah. Who's gonna know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they probably catch me. <laughs> if that's what keeps you on the right track. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> so if you go to page 74, the key questions today, key question or the uh, video teaching notes, the key question, who am I? And we could add a little bit more to that because there's a song about it and we find it in scripture. Who am I that God notices me? Who am I that, as Jesus tells us, and as we saw previously in the study, that Jesus knows how many hairs that we have on our heads. You know, Jesus cares enough about all the birds and uh, the feet, birds of the air, I guess. Uh, how much more will he care about us? If God cares so much for each one of us that he was willing to die on the cross for us, die a horrible death so that we would never be separated. I mean, who am I? Hopefully by the actions that we've seen God perform and that we read about and that we study as we read our Bible and we hear about on Sunday, <laughs> and we see lived out in the lives of other people around us, hopefully we'll say, well, whoever I am, my identity is not in me and the things I've done. My identity is in the one who I've, I put my faith and trust in. And so that's the key question there was, who am I? And then the key verse, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. And, you know, Jesus at one point said, suffer the children to come unto me. And we always imagine little children running up to Jesus. And that's part of it. But it, we're all the children that hopefully we'll come running up to Jesus with that same amount of child, childlike delight and, and recognize who Jesus is. Then the key idea, I believe I am significant. significant because of my position as a child of God. Significant to God. God cares about us. And God loves us. And so that, that's why we're significant. And that's why our position is so important as children of God. And then you are a somebody because you are the child of the ultimate somebody. And then I am free from 
And if we look, if we really believe this and lived our lives more often, believing that we are free from condemnation, we, we could do so much more. You know, we wouldn't have those times in the middle of the night when we wake up thinking about how, what wrong we've done. And instead we would, sure, confess the wrong that we've done, but accept the forgiveness and not keep taking out that condemnation and letting it keep us up at night. You ever That's brought up there sometimes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Were you brought up in a negative atmosphere mm -hmm. at home? Some of us girls, I don't know about my brother, but I feel like I was nobody. <laughs> Called names and so forth. So something like this is just the opposite. That's a great point. It is just the opposite of it. Because was thinking in those days when you are a young married father and you're responsible and you got a whole bunch of trees on the land, you gotta clear the land, you gotta build your you needed help. You needed a son. And what a wonderful gift that'd be. Not only one, but maybe two, maybe three. And in our family tree, something like yours, I got a girl. That's not going to help me be. And then it comes along Betty. Another, Another disappointment. And then comes along Lois. Three oh, girls. God, help me. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a farm. Both my mom and dad's families were like that. In my mom's six girls and one boy, <laughs> and in dad's five girls and two boys. Oh, okay. I think we got a record in the storm center. I think it was like 12 girls and then one boy, David Storm. <laughs> Well, if you remember June Jones, she had 12 granddaughters before they had their, she had her first grandson. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we had pretty much boys, didn't we? Grandchildren. Maybe we've got one girl. And, you know, I'm not saying that your father didn't love you. Right. It's not about at all, but you're just being practical. Right. You weren't worth a whole <laughs> Now in the Russell family, <laughs> that is news. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother, there was Mary, then there was Wilma, and there was my mother Ruth, and they were pioneer farmers. And right. We can do it too. In Delaware County. Okay. We can farm. And then there was Delaware Edna, House. and I think then there was Jim, and then there was Teresa, and then there was Arthur. Teresa. Uh, Teresa. Or, uh, Two. Florence, yeah. Florence. Or she had a daughter named Florence. But you know, it's the old, well, God, it's not fair. Oh, pity me. <laughs> and so that, that brings us to another question that we could ask is who am I? What does our culture answer when they think about who am I? Because Ron was talking about a little while ago about. Uh, making money and how that's really what our culture does talks about that's what's important and so it really doesn't matter how you make money well unless you're stupid enough to get caught but you know if if you don't get caught and you know you you, you become very wealthy you know that those are the people that the culture holds up so when the culture says who am i they open their pocket or they open their wallet or their pocketbook and they look and see how much they got and they say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah. I'm not going hungry. And, 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 and that's just the opposite of that verse that we started with today about teaching or in rebuking because those were to teach us righteousness. And our culture has no interest in righteousness today. What can we get away with? And, you know, cheat on our taxes. You don't, 
if you drive down the road, you'll see that, well, most of the time I can get away without stopping at stop signs. Most of the time. Yeah, but it hasn't happened to me. Right, that hasn't happened to me. Yeah. Kill me. So, <laughs> why is I'm going to stay home when you're on the road. I forget where. <laughs> and it used to be those two yellow lines, solid yellow lines in between the lanes. They used to mean something, but they don't really mean anything anymore. We got passed twice yesterday on double yellow lines. And, you know, they're, they're, we were going the speed limit, but that's, that's not enough. That's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so who am I in our culture today means something different than who am I from God's perspective. What were you going to say about the Russells? <laughs> what? I'm glad to hear that. Well, no, they had the same situation where girls came along when they needed boys to farm. Oh, oh. Did the girls but there's farm? Joe. <laughs> and then there's Joe. Well, um, <laughs> all these girls, their father died. Young age. Young. Oh, oh. So they had to depend on the girls? Did they do the farming? But Mary, she took it. She was did a lot of outdoor work. My mother, she preferred to be in the kitchen. I don't know what Roma did too much. That, you know, at that time, they were using horses, and they had to harness, unharness. Yeah, you all, they all had, had a hoe handle. They didn't have do. any automatic. Yeah, yeah. but uh, oh. yeah, the girls can work the garden. Right. So, I'm sure a lot different. But that's not really what's important. Now, one of the daughters did not feel important. She didn't see herself, I guess, as a child of God. Mother said, I think that early on, maybe she had a defect hearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, was probably bullied or teased. Probably couldn't hear the teacher a lot. Life is just a hard struggle. And she wound up at uh, Richmond. And okay, I found that place a couple of years ago. I had a hard time finding it, but I found it. I understand she had uh, used to. Trying to find some of it? Nope, I just wanted to find that place. shock treatments. Oh. oh, that was terrible. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, life got better. Now, she never was what you call normal success. The thing was, if she could see herself as as loved as a child of God, there you go. Just as important, just as somebody as anybody else. It's all attitudes, everything. No. So, it's really important that we understand who we are, and not as the world would care to identify, but as we're reading about in this book, and as we find in the Bible, and we think about the sacrifice of Christ, that, you know, that's who we are, important enough to God, significant, so that's not a small word, significant to God, and key application number two, my worth comes from my position in Christ, not my performance. And God doesn't care if you left that little mark out of that geometry question. No. He just not care. No. But that that's again standing against that whole idea of you know making as much as you can. And I know John Wesley said something similar to that, but that wasn't the only thing he said. He said, make as much as you can and give as much as you can and save as much as you can. He, he, was, he was talking about a way of life, not just a way of cheating your neighbor. And he would never have said, condoned any sort of underhanded thing to make as much as you can. It would have been in an honorable manner, a moral and righteous way. 
can save as much as you can. Right. I live to express who I am in Christ. Where are you? That's uh, number three, key application number three. I live to express who I am in Christ. I mean, I know he goes on and says more. This is on page 74, not to prove who I am. But we don't even have to worry about that second part if we do the first part. If we're living to express who we are in Christ, we won't be trying to prove who we are. We'll be trying to prove who Christ is in us. And then key application number four, I can focus on building others up not tearing them down. Uh, yeah. Woo. Did we used to do that to build ourselves up? Used to? Someone. Used to? <laughs> do we still? I'm not in that atmosphere. I'm not in the working world, but. Well, and, you know, they, we have so many new and modern ways to tear people down now that and we can do it hiding behind a screen name and gossip. Gossip. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that's an old one that's been around since probably Adam and Eve. Yep. Tearing people down by, and you know, sometimes we uh, faint praise. Well, you got it done. I wouldn't have done it that way, but. What is it? Don't put your, don't make any comments on Facebook, but come back and watch it. <laughs> uh, that's uh, probably a good rule to follow. Mm. Happens. Mm. Yeah, it, and we see a lot of people that made comments long ago that uh, they're co they come back to bite them. And well, after all, I've thought it through, and I'm right, and you're wrong, and you can wrong it. That doesn't work out very well. No. <laughs> no, because then you find out. The church. <laughs> yeah. I think of Jesus, uh, how often he upset the Jews because they had a certain way of doing things, and you follow these rules. And I think he broke a lot of them. He's going off and reaching, like we were talking about today, Zacchaeus who climbed up in the tree to hear Jesus preach because he's short. And uh, he saw promise in him. And oftentimes we make judgment of people and uh, he sees what they can be. Mm -hmm. And he, time after time, he would reach out to the people other people would shun. I thought, wow. Well, Jesus told a lot of stories like Zacchaeus I, about people who have maybe gotten rich the wrong way and what the consequences of that could be. And yet Jesus still sees the worth in him. I, from kind of in the same area in Luke, the story of Lazarus, not the Lazarus that was raised from the dead, but the Lazarus who every day his friends carried him and laid him at the door of the rich man. And the rich man wouldn't even spit on him if he was on fire as he, the rich man came in and out. And the rich man ends up being in one part of paradise and Lazarus is in the other. And the rich man's still ordering people around. And he didn't learn that lesson about uh, it's who you know, it's not what you do. So he never knew Jesus. Was he the one that asked, uh, who did you say, Lazarus? Lazarus was the one who was the, the cripple that was laid outside the rich man's door. And he's in heaven and the other guy's asking for water to his tongue or something. Yes. Yeah. The rich man is. and Reverse roles. Right. He, yeah. he calls out to Abraham and wants Abraham to have Lazarus bring him water. So, you know, there, there's all sorts of stories about that Jesus tells us where the importance 
of relationship. Yeah, I think one's worth talking about, and that is, is the way he looked at and ministered to people with leprosy, mm. the unclean people, the people you don't even want to be near. And he healed a leper. Probably threw his arms around him. Right. I don't know. Threw his arms around you know, Jesus. We, we, we label some people as unclean. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. to do with them. Probably don't really want them in church. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Is that what we're getting to now? <laughs> well, <laughs> getting to. We've been there for years. Yeah. Yeah. I see it. It's yeah. always been in the church. What would they do to us if we decided to reach out to those people? Yeah. We Ooh, tried. Like Zacchaeus. They might. Uh, Throw a crash and wonderful so people to hang around with. Yeah. Oh. Or you might get run out of town. Well, you know, I was talking to a lady the other day and I said some things and I said, oh, we have some tough, tough decisions to make coming up. And I said something about how do you feel about this? You know, the gay issue. Mm -hmm. And I knew she went to St. Gobin at uh, DePaul. On the campus, she says she went there. She says I have a daughter that's gay. She's doing all right. You didn't say unclean. Pardon me. No, I didn't say anything. Sometimes you just gotta keep your mouth shut. You know, uh, well, gotta be the judge one of these days. I'll just but, leave it up to you. But you know, if you had a child that was gay, you sure looked at things differently, wouldn't you? The whole no, issue. I don't. I mean, if you were the parent, yeah. it's like the kid with the arm missing. You got to make a decision. <coughs> is he your child or is he not? We made a decision when uh, when Diane came to have a little talk with mom and dad. She brought her boyfriend and we need to get married. It was kind of, would you love us? You still love us? Well, you I said, dad? I didn't have to think about it. She told us about it. And I said, <laughs> I, don't I said, you want an abortion? No. <coughs> okay, keep the baby. I didn't go that far. <laughs> oh. Anyway, you know, right. you, you can push people away if you. I couldn't do it. And I think that's the important thing that. You can still love your children, whether they're gay or straight or whatever they are. You can still love them, but it doesn't mean that you wouldn't like to see them find a path out of their sin, let's say. Uh, if they're born that way and there's two children, I hear a little four-year-old say, I knew when I was four years old that I was different. Can you say she sinned? So it's a hard question. Well, when does it become sin? Well, if if you can or you cannot, some people who are unmarried remain celibate, and some people who are unmarried don't remain celibate. Where they may have both been born with a very strong sex drive. But one person makes a choice to honor perhaps God, and the other person doesn't feel that that's honoring to God or even worry about that situation. I mean, Paul well, was able to make that decision. What? Paul. Right. He said, I, I prefer you not get married. Right. Uh, be single. And be celibate. That's really what they say. It's easier for a single person to get to heaven than a married one. Well, say it again. Uh, I didn't catch that. It's easier for a single person to get to heaven than being married because you've got two decisions here to make. Do I follow this man or do I just go my way? So, um, when is a gay a gay? When is he a sinner? Well, I think that you can have a same-sex attraction and not sin. 
you can be attracted to people of the same sex, but if you don't put it into practice. That's the celibate love. Right. But they don't know the difference between love and lust. And there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. So straight people. Right. It's, 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 right. I, I, I would say right. that people, people, whether gay or straight, there are some that have that same yeah. choice to me. Right. But how, how do you get rid of that name? Because somebody that I had us listen to a tape that he was changed and that he became a Christian. And he's so busy involving telling people about Christ that he had didn't have time to be gay. So it's just yeah. So can you say I'm a son of God and don't tell anybody you're gay? Because you're well, not if gay. you're you as even now the discipline talks about non-practicing. But does a church distinguish between the two? Well, and whether God people do or not. Forgive them, we can forgive them. Right. And, and it, you know, lots of people struggle with lust. And whether you're same-sex attraction or opposite-sex attraction, people struggle with lust. And not everyone who struggles succumbs to that temptation. They make a choice not to. And yeah, it's a it, it can be a hard life for people. But would it help if would it help themselves if they got married and say I have one partner? Like we do, we get married. So we're not if it were love and not lust. Yeah. Grant them the benefit of the doubt. Although I didn't like the word marry, what was the word they came up with? Every state in the union fixed that with civil union. Civil union. Well, there was another word, wasn't there? Oh, I don't And I thought that would work, but no, they wanted marriage. And that just stirs everybody up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's sacred, does. guys. Don't mess yeah, with that definition. Does. So I, think, come up with another I, I think if they were fair-minded and loving, they might say, you know what? You're right. I shouldn't mess with your definition. Let's call it civil this or civil union. I, I think there's they should be able to live with that without us condemning them. Just don't call it marriage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't call them what? Marriage. Oh. I don't yeah. see a problem with two men living together, two women living together, but they don't need to perform the marriage. Yes, you're right. Thanks. You're right. <laughs> and out by Millgrove, we had a family where what two got two brothers and a sister? Two brothers and two sisters. And they lived together and right. there was not a thought. You didn't right. even cross your mind it might be hanky panky going on in that house. No. no. I mean they were Christian people. And there were other members of the family that were married. No. So, yeah. But that was unusual. But what Not was on the farm. unusual to me, I thought, what is that? That used to go on a lot in the olden days, you know. You More than there was. More than we realized. And you just never. And two brothers and two sisters, that, you know, that's the way it was. We didn't give them any names, did we? Yeah. That was then. This is now. Yes. We have labels for everything. Yeah. Yeah. And until right. you're properly labeled, society doesn't and, know and what to do like with you. Label. They want to live with their label. They like that label. What was that? They, Queer. They like being called that. Hmm. The two people that like to live together. They, they know they're queer? Oh, or? yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 They I, like that name. They, I wish they'd really think this thing about pride. I, to me, yeah. oh, humility yes. is Christ-like. Being proudful is not so. I we said we think that. Well, and let's go back to how we started chapter five with the question, "Who am I?" And if your identity is in one of those labels on the culture, and that is what you live for, mm -hmm. dangerous to yeah. 
So I have a little song. There was a song I said they used to sing it. You know, I'll be a Methodist till I die. Yeah, we've heard that. And uh, to me, that's getting powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and it was aimed at the Baptists, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's see if we can get back on the right track yeah. or on a track. I I would. Uh, we talked a little bit about Zacchaeus and. Uh, that was one of the things that we might have done as an exercise, but I didn't see much point in doing it as an exercise after they went through the scripture in, in uh, the little video. But if you go to page 76, uh, based on your group dynamics and spiritual maturity, choose the two to three questions that will lead you to the best. And I'm not going to try to do two or three questions. I just want to look at question number one. Many people find their identity in things that don't last, such as wealth, power, beauty, and influence. Why is it tempting to find your worth in these fading attributes? I struck out on two right away. <laughs> beauty, gone. <laughs> power, oh, I hate Influence, nobody. I mean, I'm not unofficial <laughs> administrative council. Wealth, I'm not poor. But I and, could be. It wouldn't take about four years in nursing home. Right. Yeah. So it's all going away. Or it's the stock all market. Going away. Right. It's all fleeting. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but we think about it, and isn't that really how our culture lives? And I wrote down. My answer was instant gratification. We're all about what we can get right now. And, you know, the, the more we can get, the more, yeah. and the more we want. My niece, great niece, she called me up the other day and she wanted me to take her to a lake Monday. Well, I have a doctor's appointment. Please, <laughs> please. <laughs> Well, I canceled the doctor's appointment. Of course, my, my arm is getting better. Okay, good. So I took her. She was happy. My she wanted it. She wanted it now. She wanted it now. Yeah, yeah. that was what I was going to say. And well, she was insistent. I, said, I mean, no, I haven't really done anything with her. It's all right. Yeah. We've all seen those. They've got to start learning someplace. Right. Yeah. You know, because what is it? The Jewish at twelve and thirteen, they are. In the manhood and womanhood, yeah, and they are and they are expected to act like that. And this these people don't think so. <laughs> they think these twelve and thirteen year olds are just kids and still doing what they want to do. And they're not teaching their children young enough right. some of the responsibilities that they need. Yeah. Yep, she's well, and she after like nine, so she can get in cheaper. <laughs> So Where did she learn that? I wonder. I don't know. She took the money. And she brought her own money. Or after all, she she's 20 years old on Facebook. Both those two sisters did that. What did you say? You got to be 13 to get oh, a yeah. Facebook account. Oh, no way dear. they're in their upper teens. Oh, my. I'm, I'm sorry if you're listening, but that's not right, folks. A little rebuking here going on. And the parents are not correcting them. They're just yeah. letting them go. Oh, I know we've got a nephew. Or Donnie's got a nephew. Yeah. I don't claim him. <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> uh, just so I can make it. Never grew up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, for next time, we'll be doing session number six. And... We'll be looking at the personal study for session number five that starts on page 81. So it's like a double lesson in all this paperwork. Fair warning. Yeah, yeah. It never hurts you though. Keep your mind active. I forgot to write down the answers oh. on that video. <laughs> Good heavens. Can we answer them? Gonna write them down or put them in my mind. I don't remember them anyway. I just gotta make sure that I do right. <laughs> so, did anyone else have anything they wanted to go through 
from session number five. The answers. Okay. Like the first one. Yet, God. yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children, children, of, God. God. children of God. Then I got some, I don't know. I knew that one. They're in your book. Go home and write it down. They are? Yeah. In the fine print. Yeah. Towards back of the list. Oh. Well, I got so involved in the listing, I forgot to write it down. I believe I am blank because of my blank. Page 79 are the answers. Page 79. Video notes answer key. Oh. So what is the answer? I am Whatever seventy nine significant. Oh, what you guys answer it. Significant. I significant, significant because of my position as a child of God. My position, okay. And my position establishes you my relationship. are a blank because you are a child of the ultimate child of God because you are a child um, of the somebody. You are somebody. What? You are somebody. Oh, you anybody. are a somebody because you, okay. you're not anybody. You're somebody. Play word game. Because you are the child of the ultimate somebody. Somebody? Yeah. Not too creative, huh? We'll not be here next week to the hassle. We're not going to be here next week. We camping next week? Pete is legally blind. He needs a ride to Evansville. Oh, we're going square dancing. Wednesday. We're taking him to the National Square Dance Convention. Oh, that's cool. Evansville. Does he square dance? Hmm? He, he does? He does. Oh, What'd you say? Does he? He can dance better than I can. I can see. <laughs> well, he can He, he can can see swear. enough to drive a vehicle. Oh. He knows where he's supposed to be in the square. Right. Yeah. Alaman left. And he does. <laughs> he can. He can. You know, he's got enough vision. You see that arm coming out. Yeah. Oh. Left Alaman, he'll grab it. And he's got a friend that picks him up and they go dancing. And she lives in Illinois, Southern Illinois. So she says, you don't have to pay for lodging. You can stay at my house. So we're going to stay at her house and drive an hour and a half each day to the square dance. Cool. How many days is the convention? Well, it starts on Wednesday, but we're driving on Wednesday. Wednesday. So it'll be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah, we'll attend Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and drive back on Sunday. Hate to do it to you, but. <laughs> All right. Well. Enjoy. I'll miss you. Yeah. yeah. Never been to Judy Arch. Oh, yeah. Oh, we yeah. went to the funeral. Yeah. The dead. Yeah. Yeah. And she, when he ended up in the hospital, Judy's daughter brought her pen and milk her. She, she was, retired. She couldn't, she couldn't cue it. The cue yeah. is when you tell the dancers right. yeah. what to do. What moves to She don't even, it's a shame about Judy it is. We saw it coming two years ago. Yeah. And then David, he had hurt himself badly in that fall and broke his ankle. That he did hardly ever see him dance. He's always in pain, but he taught us how to run dance. He taught us. So he just a bunch of things started happening toward the end. Just what four different things. So you YouTubers, this is all free, right? Well, let's let's have prayer and then we can continue a conversation. Ready? Gracious Heavenly Father, we again thank you for our time together. Lord, you bless us in so many ways. Sometimes we don't notice those blessings, but sometimes when we lose one of those blessings or we find ourselves in a situation where we have to turn to you more fully, we realize what you mean to us truly. Lord, help us all to remember that we are somebody because you are the ultimate somebody. We recognize our position because of who you are and what you have already done for us. 
Lord, we're grateful for the sacrifice of your son, and we're grateful for the hope that we have because of that sacrifice. Lord, be with each of us here. Watch over us. Be with the storms as they travel this coming week and keep them safe on the roads. Give them the patience to uh, travel in what can sometimes be a crazy world. Lord, watch over each of us as we go forth. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you still awake out there in TV land? Uh, what 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 <laughs> <laughs> never mind i asked if you were awake we yes i'm awake <laughs>